Hey, welcome to another morning coffee with Trevor. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews. Today is uh, another great day and going to start to go through a few more technical topics that uh, I haven't talked about too much so far. My voice is a little bit uh, <clears throat> off today because of all the talking I've been doing over the last three days at the HVACR training symposium. But today I want to talk about a little bit about system maintenance and the things you should look for and you check when you're doing system maintenance. It's important to really engage your customers about system maintenance because I don't know, some co companies will have a maintenance program, some won't. But in refrigeration, in HVAC, it is super important to do maintenance because if maintenance is not done, it's going to reduce the life of that equipment. And you see it all the time. Any system that is not maintained properly uh, does not live a long life. It runs into issues upon issues upon issues. There's lots of service calls on it. And it's not effective equipment for the customer. So, for example, something for like monthly system checks. And you have, you'll have your own system maintenance check. But I'm just going to go over a brief uh, list. And please add to it. But you, you want to do... Um, make sure that there's uh, the right amount of refrigerant in. So if you have a site glass, check it. And if it's a unit, like a residential unit, you check your subcooling and your superheat and your amps. But you want to check the site glass, see if there's any refrigerant leaks, you know, check your uh, suction and filter, uh, liquid line filter dryer, see if they're restricting it all. Check all, um, anywhere for leaks, oil, uh, check the condenser fan blades, the evaporator fan blade, check the coils, you know, see if they're plugging up. It's really important to do that because even with, uh, say you're doing in commercial space and you're walking along cases and you're, you you know, you just check one area for uh, airflow, but it's a five, um, a 12 foot case. Uh, and all of a sudden you, you stop feeling airflow. Well, that could mean there's a fan motor. You should check and verify that. You know, yes, you have to pull out a little bit of product to check it, but that's something that you need to do as part of your job. You know, check the electrical connections. You know, is there anything loose? Because this is, I see this time and time again where you're on a service call or you get a service call and something's tripping erratically or intermittently and then it's actually just a loose wire. So it's something that you should check. Check the contactors. You know, are the contactors pitting or not? If you catch a contactor that's pitting early, you could save a compressor. Right? Because it doesn't take much to usually have that in your truck or your vehicle, that contact or you check for overheating. Look at, you know, our best tools are looking, touching, feeling, listening. So take a look and see if there's any problems um, with the piping, with the insulation, with uh, overheating, something that you can see really well. Like I said already, dirty coils. And it's important to take the time to do this. Uh, check the appearance of this insulation. That's something that lots of people don't do. And uh, just verify that. You know, annually for sure, you need to be taking oil samples. Check those oil samples. Because if you don't check the oil samples, you don't know how much uh, potential moisture is in that oil. And if you're not checking the moisture content of the oil, you don't know if there's contamination in your system. And then that is really bad. That can take out a lot of compressors if you're doing it in a multiple compressor application. And I see it time and time again that uh, that's not being done. Like I've worked on lots of supermarket racks where that wasn't being performed on an annual basis. And I, I know it depends on the customer and what they wanna pay for, but you're protecting your customer. You need to talk to them about this. We need to do this annually. And I know on CO2 systems now, it's highly important. All the manufacturers recommend doing it definitely after a few months after startup and definitely every year for sure. Some say eight months to a year, they want you to do an oil sample, especially on bigger system, industrial systems, just because um, we have been getting complacent and not really pulling the proper evacuation on system. And it's not only in refrigeration, but the same thing is in HVAC and commercial, residential, and even this week at the HVACR symposium, I sat in with Jim Bergman and I talked with a few people and lots of people still aren't pulling a deep enough back. And there's a special way to do it. You know, 
there's a, a ways to pull quicker vacs. If you're using quarter inch hoses, you're not pulling the vac. If you leave in uh, the depressors, you're not pulling the proper vac. Even though you have like a six CFM, eight CFM, 12 CFM uh, evacuation uh, vac pump, it can't pull through those little tiny hoses. So you need like half inch, three quarter hoses, and you're gonna pull in a quarter of time. You know, you don't have to wait there a full day. You know, it's not gonna take you 11 hours to pull down. And this is something that you need to understand how to pull a proper evacuation, especially on natural refrigerants. But anything with POE oil, because POE oil is very hydroscopic, um, you need to check that. You want to also check, you know, the, the conditions of the evaporators. Make sure the fins are straight. Make sure the condenser fins are straight. Because if they're all bent to damage up and you can't get airflow through them, you're going to go off on high, high pressure, most likely high temperature maybe, but it, it makes your pressure jump all over the place. I've noticed it uh, with analog gauges that you, you'll see it bouncing a lot if you have a lot of uh, non-condensables. I've definitely seen it with nitrogen because I've tested it. I put it in a system. I added a bunch of nitrogen in the system with refrigerant and ran it and I could see it bouncing really hard. And then it was running real higher pressures when non-condensables in the, in the system because you can't, this is something that you're not, compressing uh, or uh, condensing. Okay, so case maintenance. This is super important. You know, you want to check that airflow. Like I said, you want to check the honeycombs. This is something that, you know, lots of technicians, new technicians don't know that inside cases, there are right near the light a lot of the times. There's a honeycomb. And what do I mean by honeycomb? It's actually like a uh, supply grill, but it's like a thick plastic thing with lots of holes in it. It looks like a honeycomb. And you have to pull those out and look behind them to see how dirty they are. Because as the air comes into the case, if the store is really dirty, there's lots of people coming in and coming out. If it doesn't have the right pressures, you know, if you have a, a negative pressure in the store, it's going to suck in lots of dirt. If the filters and the air handlers aren't being changed, you're going to have a lot of dust in the store. What happens, it gets into the case, it pulls it through the coils, and then it'll get up in top of this discharge uh, or supply grill, which is called a honeycomb. Then they get all dirty up. And so if you don't have that clean, you're not going to be able to get the proper airflow. Well, you get the airflow of the coil, but you're not boiling off that refrigerant because you don't have the airflow. And then what will happen, you'll start to get a fr frozen up coil or you potentially get flood back back to the compressor. So it's important to, to clean uh, those honeycomb grills. Check the evaporator is a huge one, having the proper tools. And, and sometimes there's multiple evaporators. So you need to check that. I've seen pictures on social media and some newer cases that I haven't worked on before. You got the, your main one that's at the bottom uh, coil. But then you also have under these newer cases, you got a coil in the back behind the shelves. You know, and I've even seen somewhere they got a compressor in the back behind those shelves. I'm not sure how you get to those. I guess you got to pull everything out. That's what it looked like. But you want to make sure those evaporators cleaned and understand if there's multiple evaporators in there that you want to clean them all. The fan blades are super important. I've seen so many techniques. I've even done it before. Don't get me wrong. Like, oh, it's, it's bent up a bit. I'll bend it back. I can I can get that uh, 45 degree angle no problem by looking at it. No, it just doesn't work. If it's bent, you get it. You can straighten it out for it to get some airflow until you get a new um, fan blade. Should have them in your truck if you work on the same type of cases all the time. You should have that those in your truck to replace those because when they bend, you're not getting them back. And then what happens? You're not getting the proper airflow. Will it still work for sure? It'll work, but you're gonna put. Um, you know, you begin to start wearing the bearings on those motors. And they're not just gonna, they're not gonna last as long. You wanna check defrost operation, verify those schedules. That's super important. And then in the first place, you need to really understand what's happening with defrost in general. I was talking with uh, somebody yesterday and they were maybe the day before and they were telling me like that uh, they're running into uh, defrost issues sometimes on uh, deli cases. So they're using medium temp, but they're using off time, but they're running super cold they're running like the coil at like 20 fahrenheit like that's so cold and if it starts to freeze up and you don't have enough defrost uh, air air is not going to defrost it quick enough right when you run that's why in low temp application you need electric defrost or hot gas defrost or cool gas defrost whatever it is 
And if you do not defrost all the the frost, because it's only supposed to be frost on there, not ice. But if you don't defrost all that frost off there, it's going to start to grow and then it's going to turn into ice. And that's the big, big thing is when when you see ice on the coil after a defrost, you need to figure out why that's happening and, and repair that because what's going to happen, you got to think in your head, well, if this just defrosts and I still got ice on that coil, that means the next defrost is going to be more ice and then more ice and then more ice until the whole coil is frozen. And then you can cause damage by bending pipes and stuff. But it's important to take the time to, to recognize. And that's using your visual, visual sense. And thinking as well, like, wow, okay, I just finished defrost. There's ice. Uh, there's still frost there. I need to figure out why. And then you come up with a plan. One case I've seen a lot in the supermarket industry is where they don't use the ACR fitting, these special T fittings for reverse flow gas defrost. They just use a regular T and that they run into issues like that. If you got the seals on on doors or panels, you know, good airflow, you want to make sure that you have the proper uh, gaskets on different doors. If it's a walk-in box, walk-in cooler, if it's glass doors. And most cases now you're seeing more and more cases having doors on it, even coffin cases with doors. You want to check all those seals, make sure there's no infiltration because it's just going to lead up to more frost, more frozen cold, more humidity on the product, maybe icing on the product. Uh, proper door heater operation, you know, if you have um, drain pans uh, as well as drains themselves, you're going to blow those out, check them, make sure that they're clean. Because if they start to freeze up, they get dirt in them. Uh, they will start to freeze up that coil, the, the case, and then it'll lead to freezing up the coil. And then it just, it's just a lot of work. So you want to just make sure that you check that during your maintenance is because it's, it's super important. Good morning, guys. How you doing? Good morning. Yeah, so that's that's kind of what you need to do for maintenance. And you've got to come up with your own maintenance plan. And it depends on the application you're doing, if it's a residential, if it's commercial HVAC, if it's uh, supermarket work, if it's commercial like commercial work you know you're working in restaurants or you got to have a maintenance plan and even though your customers do not purchase a maintenance plan when you go into a service call you're supposed to be checking that stuff because if you go to a service call for something and you the coil is dirty you got to clean the coil even though it's not tripping off on high head it's part of that service call so you need to you need to look at these things and then write that stuff in your report write it in your report but make over time, you'll have a great checklist. So if you're new to the industry, you should be building a checklist of all the different checks. And you know, it is, I've said it many, many times, it is tedious, but when you get this systematic approach and you have all the, this massive checklist and you check everything off, you're gonna find the problem out. Or as you're checking it off and you're fixing each of those problems, when you run into those problems, like if it is a dirty condenser or a coil or a fan out, it's gonna to lead to solving the problem. But what happens is a lot of times nobody has a checklist. What do I do? Well, let me just check my pressures and my amps and let's see if I can figure it out just by that. Well, you can't always just figure it out by that. You need to go check, is the fans actually running? You know, is, is the equipment working? Is the liquid line cold or warm? You got to put your temperature probes on that. You need to check that stuff out. And I really think like I've had many conversations this week, we need to get more people to understand temperatures over pressures. What's the SSTs? Because there's so many different refrigerants. You can tell me one pressure and well, what refrigerant is that then? You know, and then you got to go into the PT chart and you got you understand temperatures all around because this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to maintain a temperature in a room or in products or so if you can start thinking in that way, it's gonna just make it a little bit easier to to talk about it. Well, I know in that coil it's 25 SST. It's not, oh, I know it's 55 PSI. Then you got to convert it. It just makes it a little bit quicker and easier when you're talking in temperatures, I think, anyway. And it saves a little bit of steps. Do you still need to write down the pressures for sure? I think it's really on. Uh, I made that yeah. mistake. Yeah. 
I think early on I, I used to make that mistake. I used to always focus on on pressures, and then it got yeah. it got harder as we got into more refrigerants. Um, yeah, you know, keeping track or uh, fully, you know, understanding. So once I switched the temperatures, it became easier to understand, or or even to communicate to other techs like what's going on. Yeah, yeah, and I I really believe it just it just changing that mindset because that's where we're we're programmed to be like okay you know, the first thing is check your pressures and temperatures but that's not the first thing when you're going into a service call you don't need to go check your pressure temperatures right off the bat you gotta go see if the equipment's even running you gotta, you gotta check if there's power even to the equipment but there's no point of gauging up if the system's not even running and you want to put the gauges on as less as possible. You got to buy new tools like field piece has Testo, yellow jacket, all of them where you can just put the, uh, a little probe on. You don't need to put hoses on because if you're putting hoses on and you haven't cleaned the hoses, what are you putting into the system? And people say, well, Trevor, it's pressure going into those hoses. Yeah, you're right. You're putting pressures in the hose, but if you fill that up with liquid, you're putting that liquid back into that, into that system. And then if you got dirty oil or if you got any little bit of residual um, refrigerant in there, you're putting that back into the system. And this is what we see. And well, one of the big things too, is that we're, we're still not pulling proper evacuations. Like if you want to pull down to a hundred micron on a new system, you can do that. You know, if you want to pull down to 200 micron, you can do that. Even on uh, old systems, you just got to spend a little bit more time, but you don't have to spend a day or two, depending on how big your system is. But if you're just doing a circuit or something, or you're doing a package unit, or you're doing a five-ton condensing unit, it doesn't, it doesn't take that long. If you got if it's leak-free, you you sweep it first before you put the vac pump on it, you know, and then you put the put the pump on it, and you've used the proper hoses, proper fittings, no cores, no depressions in there. Have the proper hoses, it's gonna pull down real fast. And this is something that I didn't I didn't really understand when I was nobody taught me that. And when I was out there, like we use three, eight hoses, but, um, you know, I didn't, didn't understand the, the value of using hoses. I've done so many systems where I just, use, I didn't do it directly from the pump directly to the system, you know, cause you're going through a, so you got five foot hoses. So you go five foot from the pump up to your manifold and five foot from your manifold to your system. So you get 10 feet of run for that. And we need to understand that there's quicker and easier ways to pull an evacuation and you can pull them down really, really low, uh, extremely low. So I'm going to actually start adding more of these videos that I've seen on how to pull quick evacuations on refrigeration equipment. Because I know watching a few of Jim Bergman's one where he pulls them down, it's just incredibly fast. And then even if they're retrofit, so you replace this TX valve, you know, you pull it, pull it down and you do like a triple of a bit of a triple evacuation because you get that refrigerant in there on new systems. Um, I've been told that you, it, you don't need to do a triple evacuation for new systems. Or, you know, or you don't have to sweep. You got to do your very first sweep because what will happen is that uh, this is something I learned. If that if you don't sweep it with nitrogen first and there's moisture in that system and then you put a bunch of pressure in there to pressurize and say up to 250 pounds, you are crushing that that uh, um, potential moisture in the system, creating potentially water in that system is going to take a lot longer to pull it out. So what you want to do is sweep it with nitrogen to, to sweep any moisture out there before you even put the vac pump on the very first time. This is even on nooses and uh, the least amount of time you can keep anything open before you put it in. That's, that's going to help you out so much. You know, last thing to open up is the filter dryer because it's going to be absorbing the compressor manufacturers only want you to open to have the compressor open for like five minutes. And I've seen me have them open for a half an hour or an hour. Like I open them up, I'm ready to do something and I get a call or something or I'm pulled off that to go rush to a, something else at that site. And I'm already trying to figure it, and then it's all 20 minutes later, and it's already been open for 20 minutes, right? At any time, any POE system, it's absorbing. So, and this is why it's important to do those acid checks or those oil samples because if you make a mistake on the the initial install, you're going to see it maybe one week, one month, one year down the road because of the install. 
just this uh, just this past week, I I showed a guy, somewhat seasoned guy, how to uh, use a valve core remover, not use his gauges, and pull pull straight with a vacuum, and then um, his vacuum already came set up with his vacuum. I mean, his vacuum pump came set up with his gauge uh, tied right into his pump, and I told him, hey, what? That's that's probably the worst place you can put your your gauge. You're not measuring an, ac an accurate vacuum of your system. You you measuring an accurate vacuum closest to your pump, so it's yeah. gonna be close. You know the lowest there. So, um, I think it was the first time he ever used the valve core remover, and then what? not used, not used a, a manifold for a vacuum. And I told him like, you know, you're, you're gonna cut your vacuum times down way down by by doing this. If you just you know just forget about trying to do this to whatever way you were taught. Yeah. Uh, and it, was that a, that a residential application or was it commercial? It was a commercial. It was a, um, a multi-zone uh, mini split. Okay. So, so yep. Yeah. I was, was showing him uh, Jim Bergman's evacuation. If you know, you, have you ever seen Jim's? You know, I'm sure you have, but if not, he shows how to pull it down so quickly. It's, it's incredible. And uh, uh, one of the things that, um, that you, we need to continue to en enlist in people is that there's quicker and easier ways and using that, those removers is very important. What, what I learned this week as well is that those, those valve core removers that don't last forever. So after a year or two, you need to replace them, right? And that's something I, I did, didn't really know. I used mine for years, you know, the same one. So, but you got to think about that too. So tools don't, some tools don't last forever. So you, depending on the type of tools, you might need to replace them. So, and uh, another thing, the one you just said, where it has the gauge on the, the pump, that is only to check how low your pump will pull, not your evacuation. So I didn't know that either. Uh, and I assume that, but I didn't, I didn't know until I was told by the manufacturer, that's just to test the pump. So you don't have to gauge up with your, your micron gauge to the pump. So you just turn on it and it'll tell you how low that pump will go. So if you need to change the oil in the pump or not, but realistically you should be changing pump oil. Uh, and there's different kinds of evacuation pump oil. I didn't know this either. There's like super cheap stuff super expensive stuff and there's differences between them you know and depending on what you're doing and it'll pull a deeper vacuum um, so i gotta look into that a bit more to understand that a bit more but i think one of the biggest issues in in the industry is we're not pulling proper evacuations jim was talking about in the 1960s there's a book and i, I think i even did a post on it about how to pull evacuation it used to be 100 microns that's what they everybody wanted to pull you down to 100 microns and for some reason it, it got up to 500 microns or a thousand microns and that's with mineral oil you could get away maybe with that stuff with poe oil you're not getting away with that stuff you may be able to set it up and everything works and it's great at that time but it doesn't mean that sis is not going to run into an issue down the road and this is why looking at the stuff during maintenance is super important Checking the site glass, see if you have moisture in the system. Um, checking across the filter dryer, see if they're starting to plug up. Because that's the only way you're going to, other way you're going to pull moisture out of the system is through those filter dryers. If you don't pull the evacuation deep enough, it's going to be uh, out of the filter dryers. And it was pretty cool to see some of the, the images of how deep they, they pulled. And I was sitting with Andrew Graves. Uh, the other day of NAVAC and he's uh, he has a video that he said I can use in some of my trainings is that they you they did this way with uh, 2500 or you know, 2500 ton uh, chiller where they pull it down like um, real fast so I want to go and I want to check that out because a lot of refrigeration technicians well that's a residential application you know it's different pulling evacuation on a refrigeration system so so it's like i want to go and show them this uh this big chiller application where they use the the big true blue hoses they use the proper pumps they use the core tools you know and they're doing it directly like the correct way it takes maybe a little bit longer and it probably doesn't it doesn't take longer to do the setup and you're cutting your times instantly 
It was shown there. He was shown examples of, you know, pulling 11 hour vacuum and that same vacuum with the right setup was done in less than an hour. <laughs> like you don't have to wait overnight. I, I was uh, trying to, uh, I was trying to tell that to, you know, our guys and, and either other guys have run into in, in, in new brand new residential in brand new residential systems. I think I even have one recorded somewhere. I don't know if I should post it. Anyway, I have one recorded where, yeah, I could pull, I think it was like a, just a full line set, 50 foot, three ton, whatever, but everything was brand new. I had the small battery, Navac battery vacuum, and I pulled it in less than five minutes. Within five minutes, I'm, I'm down to 500 microns. You know, yeah. the, it used to take forever and then you weren't accurate. And yeah. then, um, I, you know, some of the things that you don't think about, because the first thing everyone says, well, what, what does it matter if it takes me, if it's that quick or that's the time I use to do my wiring or whatever, or you're going to check other stuff. But I think there's a, there's a, a good sense that, you know, you did a good job. Like mm -hmm. You, you know, nothing's going to break. There's it, the things you can't see. Well, they're done. They're done properly because if you, there was any other um, issue, you wouldn't been able to pull down that quickly. Yeah, exactly. And then it just, and then, because if you're on piecework now too, right? Because a lot of times you install, you're just getting paid for for that job. You're doing your wiring. Well, now you get your evacuation. Then if you do have a leak by chance, you're going to pick it up a lot faster if you pull, you're pull. you not pulling down that quick. You know what I mean? Instead of, oh, it's been on there for two hours and I'm not where I should be. <laughs> so it just makes that much more, more uh, efficient and effective. Cause you could have someone else working on the wire while you're doing the evacuation and, and planning and working on other things. So it's super important to, to do that. And then once again, I was started off with talking about maintenance. Like you need to check that oil, take that oil samples on residential units. You're really not going to be doing that too much unless, you know, you have a, a larger house with a larger ton of uh, air conditioner that had a bad burnout. And then you want to, you know, you just replace the compressor. But what I'm seeing more and more of, technicians aren't replacing the compressor they're just replacing the whole condensing unit like what a we're wasting a lot of equipment it just as people like it's the troubleshooting is not as accurate as it, as it is going to be like we need to train and teach people more but i hear more and more it's like i don't train change compressor i just change the whole condensing unit i'm just like what so it's that's yeah, it's something that's different that's happening because there's if you're not not changing replacing the parts properly it's gonna it's gonna cost more money for everyone in the long run they're not really disposable condensing units they, should, they shouldn't be anyway okay so what do you guys think about Evan. No, well, just just uh, the morning coffees. You guys came like every day. Like you've been here for thirty some days. I know you guys are enjoying it. Um, I think we're gonna have to start. I'm gonna have to mix it up and 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 change it a little bit and move it. I don't know to when. I like this time actually. I may I may continue to do it at six thirty. We'll do it for the next couple of days because I still have a few more open days. Um, let me look. Why is that? You're recording. Okay, let me just stop this recording. <laughs>